This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics, dare to sound different. It goes back a long way with Billy and I because he is a Long Island native, as I am. Long Island being a suburb of New York, for those of you who may not have heard of it. And I had seen Billy play back. He was in a band called The Hassles back when I was 17 years old. And he played at my father's restaurant. And uh, we went way back. I opened a lot of shows for him when I was on Columbia particularly a show in Allentown, Pennsylvania, where he, he had a hit song called Allentown. And when yeah. I was, uh, when they told me I was going to be inducted into this Long Island Music Hall of Fame, I reached out to Billy and asked him if he would do me the honors of giving the speech, because I think he's probably the most famous musician to come out of Long Island. And uh, he agreed, and it was just, you know, a fabulous night. He gave a really wonderful funny speech and uh, then three days later you know he was doing that residence at madison square garden playing once a month and he invited me to join him on stage and i sang walk on the wild side of course by lou reed who another long island native and uh, that's how how it happened amazing uh he is a legend uh, alan town's a great great tune i mean all of his all of his songs just have that kind of melodic hook to them so the strangers that that's your favorite billy joel album i mean it's probably mine as well it's probably the one uh i listened to the most i'm not sure what the year that that came out it was really kind of the breakthrough album i think for him on columbia and he had played on one of my albums an album called night lights and he played the piano on a session at electric lady studios in new york uh, we had become friends and he, he came down and I asked him if he'd play in that tune. And man, he was so fast. It was like one take and it was just fantastic. You know, he, he is an unbelievable musician. He, he always says he's not good enough to be a, a, a classical pianist, but I doubt that, you know, he, he's really got the chops to play just about anything he wants. Yeah, I, I, I was going to ask about that because he is sometimes a bit down on himself and he's he kind of I've read quotes like, oh, I was never as good as I wanted to be. And it's like, how good did you want to be then? <laughs> uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, is Paul McCartney? I have thought about this more and more, particularly on The Stranger. Is Paul McCartney like a major influence of Billy Joel? Because there is something quite McCartney-ish about what he does. I mean, he's obviously a much better piano player than Paul McCartney. Uh, I think I think so. I think uh, I think certainly as a composer, you know, Paul McCartney in the in the world of pop has certainly been one of the most adventurous composers of rock and pop songs there has ever been. When I first saw Billy play the first time, uh, the band The Hassles they opened the set with "Give Me Some Lovin'" by <laughs> Spencer Davis with Stevie Winwood you know, made famous. And Billy did it note for note perfectly. And he also sang the song, sounding exactly like Stevie Winwood at the time. But uh, then there was a little tour, I think, with Billy and Elton John together. Yeah, the face to face. Two of the greatest piano players in the history of rock and roll, so. Unbelievable, yeah, that must have been really good. It's a shame they started bickering. I mean, I think they're mates again now, but it would be great to see that again. I mean, what a what a catalog two unbelievable catalogs but the stranger specifically has i mean almost every song is like beyond the classic it's like a standard which which are the ones that off the top of your head really speak to you i think it's that title track the stranger you know just the, i'm not sure if that opened the album or if it came later uh, i, I think know, it's the, the second tune is it, what was the opening to moving out okay move, well <laughs> That's that other side of Billy, you know, kind of that very popish up uptown kind of like uptown girl and songs like that. But I thought the stranger, you know, I don't know if he got that title from Camus, from Albert Camus famous novel. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that was and the production on that was really beautiful, too. 
he he gets i feel like he doesn't get enough credit for how good his lyrics are uh he is a fantastic lyric writer billy joel at least that what i think he is things like scenes from an italian restaurant they paint paint such vivid pictures um do you, have you spoken to him about why he uh stopped writing new tunes well, when was that in 92 93 it was a long time ago uh I don't know what we never really spoke about that. Uh, he wrote so many great ones. Maybe he just thought it was time to stop. I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, he seems to still perform the old ones, you know, as if they were new. Yeah. When I saw him perform at Madison Square Garden. You know, he did all those, uh, you know, Captain Jack even back to that one. Yeah, he you know, dusts still- off the deep cuts, doesn't he? He still, you know, has the same uh, passion as as I can always remember is when I used to open for him back in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen him live a couple of times on, on the recent tours and it is unbelievable. The shows are unbelievable. The set lists have a lot of detail put into them. And yeah, I mean, it's not for the fans to sort of say, oh, you should still be writing for us. Uh, he's already achieved all, all that he needs to. Another great American artist whose album you've chosen uh, is Bob Dylan. And you've chosen Blonde and Blonde. How much of an influence is Bob Dylan on you? Well, Bob Dylan, uh, I could say so much about him, but uh, primarily, you know, he opened the doors for sophisticated lyrics in rock and roll, for for poetry, if you will, in rock and roll. I mean, before Bob, uh, it was pretty moon, June, spoon love songs. You know, I love her, she loves me, she doesn't love me anymore, what do I do, you know? I mean, that was kind of the main subject matter. And Bob really opened that up just yeah, exponentially, you know. Uh, I don't know if there's ever been a song with as good as lyrics as like Visions of Johanna from Blonde on Blonde. I mean, it, it, it really reads like a novel. Uh, so, you know, that. but, and in fact, because his lyrics are so amazing and so literary, it has often overshadows his music. Which, he, which he's an amazing composer, you know, and his voice, you know, his voice was put down so badly in the beginning, <laughs> but he's got a great voice, really. Uh, he And he's so, so on pitch. He was on pitch in the from the beginning when there was no such thing as auto-tune. You know, today, anybody can be uh, tuned up to, to sound pretty good on a computer, but, you know. Yeah, I find that slightly ridiculous that people criticize i mean dylan how old is he now is he in his 80s or i think well i know exactly because he's going to turn 80 next month and i'm supposed to do a little tour in switzerland you know uh celebrating uh his 80th birthday really cool uh and and because because now people are obviously quite critical of his his voice and and if you google or if you youtube a, a recent performance you know it is kind of like Sometimes it is a little difficult to work out what he is performing. I think he kind of likes it that way. But at the end of the day, like albums like Nashville Skyline uh, are almost like lyrics second to how good the tunes are, how good the singing is, the instrumentation. I mean, and Blonde on Blonde, all of the early classic albums, the singing, as you say, is completely on point. There's no auto tune. I think people have forgotten how difficult it is to do that. Imagine if you told your average band You've got to make this record with no auto tune. I think these days people would really struggle. They'd get really angry. We'd have a lot less rich artists than we do. I would say that. But uh, yeah, and also how you know Billy is like a chameleon. I'm Billy. Sorry, Bob, like a chameleon. I mean, when he did those, went to Nashville, his voice changed completely. Yeah. Nashville Skyline and uh, Self Portrait and John Wesley Harding, which is, you know, mm. one of my favorite albums. And then now he has a, he has a different voice. You know, it's kind of it's like Moses preaching from the mountain or something. You know, it's got this incredible depth to it and uh, ageless quality to it. So, uh, yeah, he Bob can sing. And in terms of your tour that you're doing in Switzerland, uh, when when does that start next month? Well, Tom, it was supposed to begin next month, but because of the COVID restrictions, things got a little, the situation changes, Switzerland, and I think now it's being moved to August. 
And what's it been like in terms of not being able to gig and stuff? Has that been really hard? Of course, you're uh, an expat uh, for those listeners uh, who don't know that you've been living in Paris for over, over 30 years. And I, from what I know from friends in Paris uh, and in France in general, the lockdowns are pretty strict there, right? Is, is it still in lockdown now? It, we're getting out of it. We got out of the last one yesterday. Things are the last lockdown I call lockdown light. It wasn't so serious. You could kind of go out during the day up till seven o'clock and do what you wanted. But, you know, cafes, restaurants, museums, theaters, cinemas, and most importantly to me, concert places have all been closed. So since the first lockdown, which was in March of last year, I did two concerts. And uh, there was a period in September, October, they kind of opened up, but then it shut down again. And Tom, that's been the fewest amount of concerts I've done in 50 years, I think. You know, I, I was doing up to 100 concerts a, a, a year. And I'd done the year before that, I think 60. So it's been quite a change. I, I try to keep myself busy. My guitarist, uh, my longtime guitarist, Olivier Duron, he lives in Le Havre, which is up by the channel. And we did a project where he created music and I did a spoken word with some of my poetry called The Middle Kingdom. We put that out. I started co-writing another novel with my Spanish translator. So basically, you know, try to try to stay busy. And I most importantly, I started a series of uh, Internet concerts called the Corona Couch Concerts. And I just completed my last one. I did 94 of them totally. Wow in the last year, really to stay in touch with the fans, to keep the calluses on my fingers playing guitar and uh, to remember how to sing myself. Yeah, it's really important to keep that going. That's an extremely prolific schedule of, of kind of doing things for, for your fans, keeping them occupied. It's a generous thing to do as well as obviously a thing to uh, keep yourself well-practiced, but alongside that tour to celebrate Bob Dylan, uh, do you have plans to get back out there and play? Uh, do you have, um, is that gonna be your first kind of expedition out into face-to-face -face physical uh, live music post pandemic? I do have some plans now, you know, everything changes. I mean, most of my shows last year, they would be moved forward a few months thinking that it was coming back and then moved again. So now, we have a few festivals. We're supposed to play in June in France, outdoor festivals. We'll see if those happen. Uh, but I play a lot in Spain. I mean, every January for 25 years, I've done eight or 10 shows in Spain. And uh, I'm really anxious to get back there. And there's, there's no real sign yet of when they're gonna allow international artists back into Spain. But I really miss them because the audiences are fantastic there. And what, what is it that has connected you to Europe um, so much? And, you know, would you say that your fan base is, is predominantly based in Europe if you, if you play such a lot in Europe? Uh, that's a good question and a question that I'm often asked. Uh, you know, I came here in 1971 when I was, I don't know, 20 or so, 21, and I was playing on the streets a little bit. And I just loved Europe. I just, you know the whole sense of history, the aesthetic beauty of cities like Paris and Rome and London. And, uh, you know, it, when I, I, I recently, there was recently a, uh, I wrote my memoir. It was called Just a Story from America. And what was interesting about that process of doing that is when you're in your life, like anybody else, it just seems like you're in chaos and you kind of make the best decisions you can based on the information you have. But when I was writing that memoir and looking back, it all looked like a carefully made plan that I would end up here in Paris where I've lived for this past 30 years. So, you know, I'm very fortunate. I, I went through the American major label system in the 70s, did four albums. The 80s were kind of the wilderness years for me, you know. I was just beginning as to be an independent. And, uh, and then by the end of the 80s, I had really established myself in Europe and I made that move. And, uh, you know, I'm so glad I did. Uh, without the initial push, if you will, I got from the, uh, you know, labels like Columbia and Polydor and RCA, it would have been very difficult for me to begin here. 
but having to come here with that kind of bona fides, as they say, uh, they, and they've been, you know, the public, the difference between European public, maybe an American public, is that over here, music, rock and roll is con considered part of culture. In America, it's more considered part of show business. That has changed a little bit over the years, but luckily I got in early enough where they took my music seriously. Uh, the French gave me a chevalier of uh, arts and letters. So yeah, it's given me great, you know, you need acknowledgement at some point along the line to keep going. And if it's not tremendous success or great record sales, it can be it can be something else. And I think whatever that that has really been important in my career. Well, you've I mean, your memoir, which is just a story from America, uh, is going to be essential reading because of the fact that you've your life. Like, I mean, I'm 30. I kind of feel like. I want to live a life as interesting as yours. I mean, I've, I've got to make up for how kind of shit the last 30 years have been, but hopefully we can improve. <laughs> I mean, I'm joking. <laughs> They've been all right. Uh, but uh, but it's one of those things where I, you, it feels like, you know, if you even just read a bit of, of your journey, it's like, it's just amazing to have followed your heart and been creative and followed your dream and gone to live in in a different place and finding the courage to do just these these things um and make so many records and really express yourself play live in in all these different countries it's just something that i think so many people uh, want to be able to do and it's hugely inspiring and uh when it comes to your career in the 70s which you touched on um there is a link between you and bruce springsteen um in the sense that both of you were kind of inspired by Dylan, I guess it's fair to say, um, and both of you, um, you know, emerged um, as these kind of hot new artists in the mm -hmm. 70s. Um, what was it like? You put Born to Run uh, as one of your favorite records. Are you So you're still a big uh, Bruce fan. What was it like cu uh, coming up at around the same time as him? And, you know, for those people who haven't discovered your music yet, um, many people listening will have, uh, what, do you feel a kinship with Bruce Springsteen? Well, I do uh, on many levels. I mean, we have remained friends for many years too, on a on a personal level, and you know, and, and you know, as terms of as a fellow peer artist, Bruce and I started in the early seventies. Uh, we were both rock singer songwriters, and this is important to differentiate. Because in the very early 70s, there was singer songwriters, but they were more coming from the folk world. There were people like James Taylor, Cat uh, Stevens, if you will. I mean, but Bruce and I, were, we were basically rockers who also wrote songs and could perform them alone. I mean, I guess that's the definition of a singer songwriter, you know. And uh, his second album and my first album, Aqua Show and his second album, which was called The Wild, The Innocent, and The E Street Shuffle. These were reviewed together in a famous Rolling Stone uh, critique, which called us, you know, the be the new Bob Dylans. I think that we were the best Bob Dylans since 1968. So that really got the ball rolling. And then, you know, every critic on both sides of the ocean, they picked up on this. And it was kind of a blessing and a curse at the same time. I mean, there were others who were grouped in uh, John Prine, mm. very much so the late great John Prine, uh, Loudon Wainwright, who you may have heard of. Uh, and yeah. then a little later, Tom Petty. The interesting thing about all that, the new Bob Dylan phenomena, none of us sound very much like the other. Yeah, that's very true. I don't really sound too much like John Prine. Our Bruce, and certainly our voices are very different. The kind of songs we write are very different. Yet, we were all lumped in. And I think it was really, be more than anything else, Bob had gotten very quiet at that period. He was not doing a lot. It was before this amazing, uh, I wouldn't even call it a comeback, but just a reemergence with Blood on the Tracks, which mm. came about in 1975. So I think everyone was looking for a quote, new Bob Dylan, not to be like Bob Dylan, but just to 
have that same the same sense of lyrical sensibility that he had. Uh, so that's really when I got to know Bruce. I went to see him play at one of his very early shows at Max's Kansas City in New York. I remember there were 30 people in the audience, but Bruce acted like there were 10,000. And I got him, I met him after the show and we have remained friends ever since. And many times in Europe, he's brought me on stage with him to sing with him, to sing Born to Run. And uh, he even brought my son on stage as well when he played at the Stade de France, which is like the 80,000 seat arena here in Paris. And we got up on stage and sang Born to Run with him. And that, I can't tell you what a thrill that was to see me and Bruce and my son Gaspar on that stage singing with him. It was like, wow. wow. That must have been incredible. I mean, what is the common thread, do you think, that leads to those comparisons? Is, is it the fact that the instrumentation is kind of organic and 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 you're you're all singer songwriters and there's something kind of pure about the, the music in, in all of your cases what would you describe as the common thread if any i would like to say that i mean all the things you said that the something pure something true uh Maybe we're all what you might call confessional singer songwriters. We're basically writing about what's going on inside of us. The seventies is also looked on is often looked on as this golden age of music. However, it was, it was but if you go back and check the charts, oh yeah, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there that was not really. And I'm not putting anyone else down because, you know, this is a big tent. There's a room for everyone. But when my first album came out, Aqua Show, the most popular song of that year was Tie a Yellow Ribbon Round the Old Oak Tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this was not like a Rolling Stone. So, and it's a great song and it's a great pop song, nothing against it. So we were actually doing a kind of music that was not very well accepted at that time. And it was different. It was vastly different from the majority. It was not formula in any way. I don't think any of us were consciously trying to copy anybody. I think mm. we were just trying to tell our truth and using the kind of music that we understood. We all, Bruce and I, at least, we, we came from bar band scenes, me on Long Island, him from New Jersey. You know, we grew up uh, with R&B and uh, on the, the radio in, in New York, in the New York area, which was always very vibrant. And we both had an epiphany when we saw the Beatles appear on the Ed Sullivan show. We thought, that's what I want to do. Yeah, it seems like that was the case for, for so many people. But that's such a good point that you're making about how we all glorify, well, I mean, at least I do, and many people that I know glorify the 70s as this golden era, which it was. But it's like there were kind of... Uh, without putting anyone down, but I'm going to kind of put people down. Uh, it's just like there was a lot of crap on the radio or like forgettable one hit wonders and and just a lot of commercial records. A lot of people knew that they were making, there was the same kind of novelty music that you might find doing well commercially. Mm -hmm. And it's not like all the critically acclaimed albums that we treasure now are massive hits that you heard all over the radio and everybody was listening to high culture. There was still kind of commercial stuff. Do you think that that's almost the same now? A lot of music snobs say there's nothing good now, but there, it, there are loads of great things. It's just they're not all at the top of the charts. Um, do, you, do you like modern music? Do you listen to much? Or are you kind of preoccupied with what you already know and love already? Well, I certainly am still faithful to that music I, I know and love, you know, and with a lot of the, the artists I put in uh, that list of my five favorite albums, it was very difficult because for so many of them, almost any of their albums are my favorite albums, you know? Yeah. C certainly for Bruce and Bob. But uh, I think that today, uh, you know, most of the music I listen to today I, is recommended by my son because he's also in the music business. He's a producer and a mixer and a musician. So he'll tell me I should listen to this or listen to that, War on Drugs, a band like that, you know, or things like that. Uh, a guy named Kurt Vile, I really liked one of his tunes. Mm. Uh, but for me, the, the, the only thing I kind of uh, is disappointing is that 
the album concept has been lost. Yeah. And this was really important in the 70s that you you created this work and it was an album. You were not just creating songs. This was supposed to work in totality, you know, that the opening cut was supposed to be like when the curtain goes up on a Broadway show. The last song on the first side was so important because that made people flip open the flip over the record and play the other side. And then the last song of the album was supposed to be, you know, leave them in a glow with what you have presented. And today it's not that way anymore because of, you know, that's just what it is because Spotify started with iTunes when people could kind of pick the songs they wanted off of any album. So I think as when the album concept came about and it came about in the late sixties and, you know, with, with Bob's blonde on blonde and with Sergeant Pepper and everything else uh, that has been a little lost, I would say. Mm, that I, I, would... I agree completely. And all of these albums that you've selected are proper albums. The death of the album, I think, I mean, there've been many factors, but it must be the final nail in the coffin must've been the playlist the playlist, which basically means that all these names come on, like especially when, when I'm trying to get into new music, if you don't listen to an album, you get all these names and you see them for one second and you listen to three minutes and then the name's out your head, you know nothing about these people. Whereas if you spend 40 minutes with them, it's not even that long, then you yeah. might get to know them a bit better. Do you do, do you use streaming services to listen to, to music? Uh, is that how you consume or do you still consume vinyl? You know, What's your main way of listening? Well, I do. I want to say that is a great, someone should write an article called The Death of the Album. That is, that is a great concept, Tom. You should. I'm sure it. people have. I'm sure I've read these articles with great pleasure because I am I do kind of bash the, the, the in my <laughs> mind, the kind of what I see is this like corporate culture of, of Spotify and stuff, but there's always been corporate culture in the music industry. You'd know better than I. It is. It is. That has never changed, really. Uh, we may think it's, we look back, through this golden haze filter, you know, the golden years, but there was always big commercial interest involved. And sometimes they were responsible for creating great music, you know, I mean. Yeah, for it was sure. My, if it wasn't for RCA, you know, and RCA was basically started making records because they made Victrolas and they needed to sell people something to play on their Victrolas. That's how RCA records came about and where, where Elvis Presley ended up. I do listen streaming services i certainly listen on spotify i it's been a long time since i bought a cd but i will buy vinyl every once in a while that's a different listening experience what i've heard i heard recently that most people on the playlist you were referring to they don't even listen to the whole song mm -hmm. i think on spotify the people listen to 30 seconds of a song and then move on to something else yeah you know the attention span has really has disappeared. Uh, I'm sure something else will evolve out of that, but I, I do listen to Spotify and I, I love sometimes where it takes me and I, I can discover a lot of music I might not have right in my hand. Like if I want to listen to some old country music, Hank Williams or Patsy Cline, I might not have those records, but I can find them there. Or and they would be difficult to find in a record store as well, especially these days, right? The record oh. stores have been closed here for a yeah. long time yeah when i started out when i was living growing up in garden city long island and there was a local record store there they had a, a rack of the new 45s and you could actually play them first to see if you liked them before you bought them that's so cool and they, they also sold guitars in that store and you could take guitar lessons in the back and that world is gone yeah i i feel really sad about that and i know i've kind of glorifying the past, painting this picture that the 70s was this amazing kind of artistic house party with people like, you know, Neil Young and Bob Dylan just writing great albums and and not caring about money. And I, I, there's, you know, that's that's bullshit in many ways. Like there's always been a completely valid business side to the music industry. But your comment about attention spans is feels right. I know people talk about uh, completion rate analytics you know how many people are actually getting to the end of your songs I mean does, does that 
but is that incredibly demoralizing? So, you know, say you write uh, this masterwork that you've poured your heart and soul into and you focus on every single last bit, particularly the endings or the fade outs or whatever. And then you find out that someone can't even be asked to get through more than 25 seconds of your tune. <laughs> Would that feel demoralizing? Well, I think we try not to think about that. <laughs> I think in terms of records, uh, you know, honestly, for me, the process has always been uh, for somewhere, from somewhere the songs come. I pick up a guitar, I want to write a song, and then I want to record that song. Now, I think I'm doing that mostly for myself, to be honest, you know. Who listens to it? I don't really think that much about that afterwards, you know. That's why the live side is so important, because they can't just listen to 30 seconds of, the, <laughs> of a song in a concert. They're your captive audience. Yeah. And that's a, that's always been a, an essential part of the uh, of the formula for me. You know, you, you write songs, you record those songs, you put out an album, and then you want to follow it up playing live. Uh, and then oftentimes on the road is when I get, you know, inspiration for new songs. I've written a lot of songs in sound checks, or, or at least the, the beginnings of those songs. So, And I think for an artist like Bruce Springsteen, who you know, I've never known anyone who loves to play on stage and please his audience as much as Bruce. You know, he put out that great album some months ago, Letter to You, and to be unable to follow that up with a tour, I'm sure is very frustrating for him. Yeah, well, I hope you're able to get back out on the road as soon as possible. I hope he is too. I know he comes to shows that are like three and a half hours long. Um, what, what an amazing thing to do. What a generous thing to do, because you don't need to do that by any stretch of the imagination. You could play for, <laughs> I don't even know, an hour. So I've known some good artists to play just for an hour. Well, back, you know, when the Beatles and the first British invasion came to America and you'd have, you know, the Beatles and the Kinks and the Dave Clark Five and the Searchers and all these other bands, you'd have like five bands on the bill and they would each play for half an hour. Yeah, yeah, the Beatles gigs were like 20... Yeah, half an hour, yeah. 20 minutes. They were, yeah, they never yeah, did a big gig. At all. There was never a Beatles gig that was like a 90 minute gig. With I don't think over an hour. I don't think there was one over an hour, but I did Crazy. one show, Tom, that was four hours and 20 minutes. Wow. How <laughs> many songs was that in the set? Every song I could sing. <laughs> Every song I could remember. We virtually stopped when I just ran out of songs, you know. I don't think I would do that anymore, but... Uh, when was that, that show? Oh, that was about 10 years ago in Belgium. And I was so hooked into that audience, they just didn't want us to leave. So, and they weren't leaving, so neither was I. That's so cool. That's such an awesome thing to do. Uh, th there's another artist on this list who is, I mean, this is a list that aligns quite uh, firmly with my own taste, but uh, I actually listened to Court and Spark by coincidence shortly before you sent this list, uh, a classic Joni Mitchell album. What does Joni Mitchell's music mean to you? Well, Joni Mitchell, I think almost more than any other artist, she is just a, an artist in the classic sense. She's a painter. She's approached, she's an iconoclast. She's approached her music in a totally individual way. I mean, I've never... I can't think of anything Joni Mitchell has ever done which has been swayed in any way by any commercial interest or trying to have a hit. Uh, she embraced jazz in a lot of her music, you know? And uh, that particular album meant so much to me because there is the song, A Free Man in Paris. Mm. That album, I Was a Free Man in Paris. And I can't tell you, Tom, as I walk around Paris, I must sing that song to myself on a weekly basis, you know, I think she was actually singing about a trip she took here with David Geffen. Oh, and, uh, yeah. He was uh, a free man in Paris because there were less business constraints on him, you know, working as a manager and, and, and running a record company. But uh, yeah, that, that was the album which really, uh, I guess, opened me up to her music uh, hissing on the what well, uh, the hissing on a summer lawns. That's another uh, one of her albums that I love. But yeah, I have such great respect for her. Uh, and she was, you know, I don't. 
she was never like a multi-platinum seller, but she did achieve tremendous success and tremendous respect of, among um, just about any songwriter I know. Yeah, she's probably the most, one of the most, if not the most mentioned artists on this show, uh, definitely in terms of critical acclaim, acclaimed by fellow musicians. Mm -hmm. She would be up there for sure. Talking about Paris, uh, why Paris? Why have you chosen um, to live in Paris for over 30 years? Uh, well, I could say it was my, uh, from watching Casablanca with Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, we'll always have Paris. Uh, but as I said, I came here in 71 and I just, you know, I love the city. There was that aspect, you know, kind of the romantic aspect uh there was the whole there is the whole history of the american lost generation of writers who came here f scott fitzgerald ernest hemingway later on henry miller of course when i was in high school i was reading a movable feast by ernest hemingway which recounts his poverty stricken days in paris much of that is very fictional by the way but uh I, so there was that certainly my connection with that with that uh then there was the practical, as practical aspects. I had a relation with an independent record company here called New Rose, which was kind of a home for Amer many American orphans of the American music business. Uh, Alex Chilton also recorded for New Rose, a lot of other people. So I had that, that was the practical aspect. And, uh, and then when I moved here, uh, Within a short time, I refound my my wife, who we'd known before, or I had met six years before, and we'd been together for thirty years. And uh, you know, we have our son Gaspar. So I'm just entrenched, and I guess I am an expatriate by heart. We they say expatriates are people who are more at home when they're not at home, and I guess that that's a good description for me. That's. Yeah, I mean, there's there's sort of many many great reasons. It sounds like it's very, a very inspiring place to live on an artistic level. Um, in terms of great artists, of course, the Velvet Underground, uh, Loaded, is an album that's inspired many artistic people. How much did it feel uplifting that someone like Lou Reed, from what I know, was was like a big fan of your work? Was that something that was jaw dropping at the time? Oh, it was amazing. It was, uh, talk about, you know, acknowledgement. Uh, so I was here in, in Rome in 71 and I was working in this film by Fellini. And there was another, there was a girl there from New York. What was her name? Ruby, Ruby somebody. And she was kind of a Andy Warhol character. And she was telling me I, if I got came back to New York, I had to go to Max's Kansas City. And she was also be talking about Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground. Now, I didn't know the Velvet Underground very well. I knew about that album with the banana on it, uh, but I, I wasn't a real fan of their music just because I, I don't know, I was more into the kind of English guitar heroes at that point and the American singer songwriters. And then when I got back to New York, uh, and I started going to Max's and people were, everyone there was talking about the Velvet Underground and especially this last album, Loaded, which was kind of, they did, there was an album after that, but I don't think Lou was too involved. Uh, and I went to see a band named Mitch Ryder. Have you heard of Mitch Ryder? Mitch Ryder and the- I've Defense. heard of them, yeah. And they had done a cover of one of Lou's song, Rock and Roll, which is from that album, Loaded. And I went to that showcase in New York and Lou Reed was there. And uh, I went up to him and said hello. <laughs> and I was, uh, all I could say was, I'm from Long Island too. <laughs> and he said, oh, really? And, uh, and so then I, I wrote those liner notes. I think I mentioned, talk about this a lot in my memoir. There was, my mentor was a man named Paul Nelson was a rock critic uh, he went to school with bob dylan he was working for mercury records and he asked me if i wanted to write liner notes for a velvet underground live album which came out in 1972 i mean after the group had been broken up it was called live 69 and i wrote those notes it begins with it's 100 years from today and everyone who's reading this is dead 
And uh, I guess he passed it on to Lou to see what Lou would think, get his approval. And Lou called my mother because that was the number that Paul Nelson had for me in the city. And my mother called me out on Long Island and said, listen, this nice boy, Louis Reed called to speak to you. <laughs> and, she, and she said, I said, wow, what did he say? What did he say? And uh, she said, well, I know you, you like, I said to him, uh, my son will be very happy to hear you called. And Lou, and Lou said, why? And, I, and my mother said, because he's a great admirer of yours. And Lou said, isn't everybody? <laughs> so, and my, my mother remembered that conversation. She passed on a few years ago, but she always remembered that. So then I got to know Lou a little bit. And when my first album came out, he said some very nice things about it to the press. He would come and see me play at Maxis, Kansas City. He really brought me to RCA Records because uh, he was on RCA at the time. You know, him and David Bowie were both there. And he got RCA to sign me and to buy my contract from Polydor because at that time Polydor was a, a new label in America and they were not very efficient. So he got me to RCA. He was supposed to produce my second album but then he had some legal problems with, uh, I don't want to go into the details, but he had some legal problems. So he was unable to do it. But that album loaded when I was preparing uh, Aqua Show, my first album, I think I listened to that more than anything else. I just, you know, there's rock and roll of a song. Sweet Jane is another song from that album, New Age. Now this is the, loaded is from the post John Cale era of the Velvet Underground. And of course, there are as many great songs back when John was in the band, you know, Waiting for My Man and all that, and Heroin, all of that. So, uh, but that was my introduction to the Velvet Underground. And uh, when I recorded Night Lights, my third album, I was so fortunate to have Doug Yule, who was in the Velvet Underground at that point, And he came and provided backing vocals and some guitar on my third album. So in that way, I think the circle was, was complete. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what an amazing story uh, about, about him ringing up as well. That yes. still cracks me up. Uh, so there, there are some resources for people listening to this uh, to find out more about your life, about your amazing life. Uh, first of all, there's your new memoir. Now, of course, you've had a career as a novelist, so this must have been, how easy was this to write? Uh, just a story from America, probably not that easy. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, where, you know, how long did it take to write and why did you decide to do this? A couple of reasons I decided to write my memoir. In 19, well, when was it? In 1980, I had started writing short stories and, uh, I met Jan Wenner, the publisher of Rolling Stone on the 57th street. And he asked me what I'd been up to. And I said, well, I've left Columbia and I'm kind of don't know what I'm doing, but I'm writing these stories. And he said, he'd like to read them. And he said, you should turn it into a novel. And I did turn it into a novel. And the novel was called Cold and Electric. And Rolling Stone was tried to get it published. And at that time, the common wisdom among publishers was, the people who like this kind of music, they don't read books. True. And uh, so, but I kept writing and that book came out in Europe and I had a couple of novels come out here as well. Uh, but then I think really beginning with Keith Richards' life, that really opened the door. That was such a tremendous success and so interesting and everybody loved it. Yeah. It was great. And then you had Patti Smith's Just Kids come out. And then there's been a host of, and Bruce, Bruce is born to run, of course. And I had started writing a memoir, a short piece about my mother, which I was trying to get into the New Yorker. And I was in contact and he, he liked the piece, but it wasn't for them. But just that was encouraged enough to start writing this memoir while I can still remember everything that happened. And at, that was an amazing experience for me, writing that memoir, because as I said before, it kind of put everything, every all of my life made sense. 
you know, of course I have regrets and mistakes and like everybody else, but it kind of, it kind of made sense. So it was a, a cathartic experience and it was a, an empowering experience too. And in terms of the documentary as well, um, when did that come out in relation uh, to the memoir? Uh, that's called The Second Act of Elliot Murphy and that's on Amazon Prime, right? Yes, that is uh, that I shouldn't. Uh, that was also part of one of the ingredients, I think, which meant which came into this formula for me finally writing my memoir. Usually it's the book and then the movie. But in this case, it was the movie first. The second act of Elliot Murphy was suggested by a Spanish director named Jorge Arianas. He said he wanted to make a film about my career and uh, he was going to start by following me ar around on the road in Spain, which he did. And then uh, it grew and grew. And, uh, and then at the very end of the film, he said, you know, we really need kind of the cherry on top of the cake here. Do you think Bruce Springsteen would, would agree to be interviewed? And I said, well, I can ask him. And I asked him and just without hesitation, so generously, he said, of course, you know, of course, send him over. You know, he was in New Jersey. And then at the same time, I was in, back in touch with Billy Joel because I had found a photo in my archives of myself and Billy Joel and Dr. John, you know, the, the great Dr. John, the three of us together. And I thought Billy would want that. And we were back in touch. And so I asked Billy and he said, sure, send him over. I'm in Florida. He can. So the Jorge went to New Jersey and to Florida and inter interviewed both Bruce and Billy for that second act of Elliot Murphy. And it came out, it won a couple of awards at some festivals, particularly in Spain. And now it is available on amazon.com. And there's also another uh, kind of movie project uh, which is, I suppose, more to do with your own writing in the sense that it's an adaptation of one of your short stories, Broken Poet. Um, was that the first time that something that you'd written had been put into film? Oh, well, absolutely. I think I can't think of anything else because that story, which was called The Lion Sleeps Tonight, was I wrote that in the early 80s. And it was very prophetic in its way because it was about a rock star who came to Paris and stayed there and kind of everyone thought he was dead. And that's the mystery of the story. Is he dead? Is he not? And Rolling Stone sends over a writer to investigate when someone thinks they spot him playing in the Metro. And on a different Spanish director, uh, Emilio, Emilio Ruiz, uh, he read that story because it was in a collection of my short stories in Spanish. And he read that short story and he said he thought that could make a movie. And uh, and he just kind of put the, put it together and I wrote the screenplay with him. Uh, and now because of, the story takes, the guy was the rock star is supposed to have apparently jumped into the sand in the 70s. So, now I could play that part because it was so much longer. <laughs> so he asked me if I wanted to play the role as well, which I agreed. I did my best. And, uh, and so that, that is fiction, though. You know, I want to just assure everyone out there, I never did jump into a river that I can remember. <laughs> what was it like, uh, you know, acting? Is that, that is, is that the first time that you'd acted? I... I mean, I've touched that world on a few occasions. As I, when I was in Europe, you know, I was in that Fellini movie. Just oh and, yeah, and uh, there was a French movie called La Ligne Blanche, The White Line, which I had a little role in. I did that, but this was really my first role, starring, uh, first starring role. I started out at the top, huh? Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, luckily, my wife Francoise, she is an actress. And she went to the conservatory here. So she was able to help me. Wow, and yeah. also one of the uh, actors, great actor, uh, Michael O'Keefe, who had, was nominated for an Academy Award for his first movie, which he did many years ago. And uh, he, he, he really helped me prepare for the role as well. Yeah, well, I mean, that's pretty good. Uh, those are pretty good people to help you. Uh, very well-trained people 
Uh, I'll tell you, Tom, it's a lot harder remembering lines to a script than it is words to a song. Yeah, that's that makes sense. Songs, I mean, great songs. They just you don't even. I feel like it's just osmosis. It's just and the river, the naturally. music kind of leads you to where you're going. You're going to the chorus. You're going to this, but when it's straight dialogue, that that's another. Is uh, it more like rote learning? Is it? It can't just. You do have to just sit down there and try and get it. There are tricks to do that, which both Michael and my uh, and my wife helped me with, because really least in my experience to act you have to first have uh internalized those words so you can just then you can do everything else else around i mean of course there are examples of actors like marlon brando who used to make the actor in front of him put his dialogue on a post-it on their forehead so he could read it <laughs> <laughs> but i certainly am not at the marlon brando level yet well there's, he he was a he was a great man. So but there's still there's still time, of course. <laughs> I, I I wanted to ask um, as my final question, a somewhat random question to, to finish off on. But what uh, led you to write your single that you released a couple of years ago entitled "What the Fuck Is Going On"? What the fuck is going on? Which has kind of had a rebirth in popularity during of the course. COVID crisis. I wrote it really after the two thousand eight. Uh, economic meltdown that happened all over the world, which very few of us really understood what it was about. Uh, I still don't understand exactly. I guess it was just about greed, which seems to be, you know, behind every economic meltdown. But uh, that's what that song was about. It was really about how for most of us, you know, we're just trying to get by, you know, pay our rent, and you know put some food on the table uh feed our family if you have a family and then we are kind of the victims of these things that are going on on a global nature we don't really understand so that that's really what, what the fuck is go, uh, going on and now uh it came out uh I, I wrote it in 2008 the fans loved it live and now since covid it's gotten a new kind of second life if you're enjoying the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.